Okay, good afternoon, guys. I'm going to try very hard to um, stick to time because I know you are running around a little bit behind. I just want to put this into a certain view. Have you got my main screen? That's quite important. Yep. Yep, perfect. Okay, fantastic. Um, I'll kick off. I'm I'm probably not going to give you a lot of stuff today that you don't already know. I think that's important um, to get across. But I want to start really by thanking Gay and Elizabeth for inviting me to do this. Um, it's great. I have been on my own, as they said, for three days now. It's uh, it's quite surreal. So I thought I'd just start very quickly with a little bit of background on me. Um, 35 years within Out of Home, 28 years within WPP. Um, and for the last 10 to 11 of that as global CEO, as COO, and before that as global chief investment officer. I was part of the overall management team that launched Group M's proprietary solution Sightline um, across 20 markets. Um, and I know in the audience today, you've got James Lambert from Group M, who was pivotal in launching it in Australia um, and was actually a great help to me um, in being able to use his guidance on certain areas to help other markets around the world. I'm passionate about the medium. I decided when I stepped down from Group M um, eight months ago, just coming out of my gardening leave three days ago, that I definitely wanted to stay in the medium. Um, I love change um, and I think change is scary, but it also needs to be embraced. So I'm going to talk today about how I believe we need to work together to increase the adoption of programmatic digital out of home. So let's start. I've decided quite early on in the process that I'm not going to bore you with a load of stats, okay? Because I think you don't want to listen to someone on the other side of the world talk through lots and lots of numbers. But I am just going to put up a couple of slides and this one is looking at digital out of home revenue from where they people statistics I took it from, believe it is today, to where it will be by 2028. I personally don't feel that any of those numbers are unachievable. Um, and if anything, I think they are maybe a little bit low. Right? I think that when you start looking at the growth numbers when we get into 26, 27 and 28, and the annual growths are sub 10%, um, I think we should be challenging that. And I think we've got a lot of work to do to be able to challenge that. The hardest number for me to get any steer on whatsoever was really programmatic within that. So for the sake of today, I'm using 3% as an average across the world, um, which gives us around 400 million. Um, I hope it's undercalled. Um, I really probably think it is. And I'm sure there's a few of you in the audience today going, oh, my God, I'm way bigger than that already. But let's not look at this as a single market. This is as a global holistic view. And when we start to look at those sort of numbers, you can see the levels of growth versus 23 that I'm saying should be achievable by 28. We're close to 700 percent growth. So these two numbers are two numbers I want us to sort of keep in our mind, 3.1 billion and 700%, okay? I also think that we've got to understand, and I'm going to say this very, very candidly, in the fact that no one sitting in the room today at your end is a competitor with each other. I know they are on a day-to-day -day basis and they have to work like that, and that's good. That's good for an ecosystem that needs to drive revenue locally as well as anywhere else. Our competitors, as we all know, are Amazon, Meta, Google, that they're taking 60%, close to 60% of all the ad budgets, right? And if they keep going at that scale, we are going to become more and more marginalized. And a lot of the conversations I was having over my last year to 18 months within the Group M network is, if only we could move one or 2% of that money into out of home that would be game changing for us. And, but the only way we can do that is to get it right. So the three areas I'm going to talk about today is education, innovation, or education, collaboration, and innovation. So I'm going to start with education. Okay? We've seen across the last 12 months, a shift 
if we look at out of home as a specialism, it's always pretty much in the more advanced markets in the world. And when I'm not being derogatory to anyone when I say that, but when you look at the UK, the US, China, the out of home specialist teams have always sat outside of the main agencies. They've always been specialists in their own right. And I think even though I've been in the industry now for 30 odd years, I felt we over confused our medium um, for the reason of keeping that specialism separate. We're seeing now Group M taking Kinetic in-house in the markets where it existed separately and creating Group M out of home. We're seeing Dentsu do the same with Posterscope. And the brands of Kinetic and Posterscope will still exist for direct clients because those clients are still part wanting to work with the specialist because of who they are, not because of who the hold co is. Okay. So little did I know when I agreed with Group M, it was the right way forward that I wouldn't be there. Um, but that's by the by, right? Because I do believe it's the best thing for the industry to do. We all know as well that digital out of home is different to online. Okay. This is quite an old slide. Okay. So I picked this slide out from somewhere. I think it was presented first by Clear Channel in the UK back in 2018. But when you look at it, it's not changed. Okay. There are two key differences the one to one of online, the one to many of digital out of home. The second one to me, which is probably the biggest one there, is the context. Online is all about the content of where you're advertising and out of home. It's the real world. And that, to me, is an area that we don't play on quite enough, but I think we've got to do a little bit more with it. Then I looked at, well, where, where have we got this? And again, this was something that the IAB did in partnership with PwC, again, back in 2019. And if you look at that, education across the US and Canada was the number one issue that everybody felt would hold back digital out of home, right? And I still think, unfortunately, when you look around, that's true. So rather than trawling online to see what was happening today, I'm a member of several WhatsApp groups about digital out of home around the world. Um, and I chucked a question into one of those groups and it was a simple question. Give me three things that are slowing down the adoption of programmatic digital out of home. The answers I got back on that were, this is just a sample, I got loads of them, um, were not a surprise to me, but they were a surprise that they were very similar to what was being said two, three, four years ago. Knowledge and understanding. People in out of home don't understand enough about programmatic. There's a resistance to change from the out of home teams because they don't understand what they're doing. Out of home is a, as we came out of COVID, is a very buoyant market. So in some markets, you have got strong IO sales. So media owners sitting there saying, why would I take the risk? Why do I want to put a part of my estate inventory into a programmatic solution where there's no guarantee I'm going to sell that? Where on an insertion order, I can do it. People still see us relatively weak at measurement and attribution. I don't personally believe that. We're just measuring it in a slightly different way. And we don't have a lot of choice. There's just digital planners don't get out of home. That That's quite a big one right? Because they really, really don't understand it, right? And we have to work with them to enable them to actually get a better one. Commercial models in the out of home world. Now, I know in Australia, it's different. You don't have them that a lot of other markets have around the world, but they're antiquated. And I think when you're, you've got a commercial model that works, why break it? I remember when we launched within Group M and I took the decision to launch Sightline across the world as a net net model. The media owners couldn't get their head around it. Um, and I was like, well, that's the only way you can do it. Right. And then the big one out of home is siloed. And I think that's changing now. So that isn't there anymore. So I think that's a that's a positive on that one. So just to, to go back, I just want to go back to that for a minute, because what I'm going to say here on education, I don't have all the answers to how we educate, um, but we've got to work together. And when I say work together, it's not just the out of home teams working together. It's the cross media teams. OK, embrace it, lean into it and really work with each other. That's the only way. When I look at innovation, there are 
several ways we can look at this. You can look at technology, you can look at creative and everything else. I'm going to focus more today on creative. And the reason that I'm not going to look at technology in too many instances is because I think there is technology there for this already. There are multiple DSPs, there are multiple SSPs, there are multiple ad exchanges. And I think that the decision on who to work with in that area is either purely down to the buyer or the seller, right? And therefore we shouldn't really interrupt that market. I also was always a believer that it would have been fantastic at the outset if we really understood what we were getting into to have one DSP for everybody and one SSP for everybody, but that isn't the case. And I don't think we can change that now. I'm going to play a very, very short video, um, and I'm not going to play all of it. I will stop it, and hopefully it will play. But this, to me, is just demonstrates in the last two years, maybe three years, how far out of play must go. I've never seen a 3D billboard until now, and it's phenomenal. That's the man right there. That's a legend. Oh, my God, bro. You see that? That's crazy. So if you look at that, that's like 3D anamorphic, as we all know, right? Works very well on curved screens. Work, it's now available to pretty much do all over the world. And people are going to sit there in the audience today going, yeah, but those screens aren't bought programmatically. I get that, okay? But you've now got the extended 3D canvas, right? Which basically means any flat screen can be turned into a 3D display area. Um, I'm going to be slightly biased. Um, we worked with a company in the UK called do.com who were absolutely phenomenal at this stuff and developing it and everything. And one of the case studies I'm going to use in a minute was from them with their permission to talk about it today. Um, but I think there are lots of companies around the world that can do this. And I think that this is another area where pushing more and more of this embraces the power of out of home in the real world, in the public space. Okay. So we'll just use a Maybelline one here, very, very simply. Their basic creative on the left was good, right? It was a standard run of the mill, run creative. And it was very simple though, to turn it into the creative on the right, right? And that ran, I believe in 15, 20 markets across the world. And big risk by L'Oreal to roll it out there. Um, but look at the upside, three time, 3.5 times as effective in driving the product. I mean, that is just phenomenal, right? And I think the more and more we can do of this without devaluing the 3D setup, okay, is going to help us grow this medium. Coca-Cola was another one, and I can't show the results for this campaign, unfortunately, because they're embargoed. Um, but at the same time, they had a major, major issue with Coke Zero, Coca-Cola Zero Sugar. And what they did here, again, UK, I believe UK only for this one at the beginning, um, was actually to tie in mobile, to tie in QR codes, to tie in virtual reality. And their sales uplift was so much better than they believed it was ever going to be that they're already coming back. And, and doing it again. So I think these are the areas of technology and innovation that the more and more we can bring into our space, the better it will actually be for everybody. Collaboration to me is the biggest one, okay? And this is the area that I really, really want to focus on in this because all of us play a part in it, okay? But I'm going to start by, there was a World Out of Home organization conversation in South Africa a few weeks ago where Tom Goddard, the chairman, always closes really, really well. And he put up six areas that he believes are needed to transform out of home. Okay. I don't necessarily agree with all of them. So I've sort of taken out the top two away from what I want to sort of focus on today because if you look back, media owner consolidation, I don't feel that we should have a say in that. That's down to the media owners. The fact that we're becoming such a more audience-led solution, 
I don't think we we should be overly concerned if we're buying off of 10 media owners, 15 media owners, or 30 media owners, because if their locations are in the place where the audiences are, which satisfies the client's needs, then we should embrace that. But measurement, I'm going to touch on value for money. And this is how I'm looking at the trade bodies. And I'll talk a little bit about you guys as well, because I think you really lent into that. Okay. And then how we can look at the fears over brand safety and win the contest with online. The cookie is crumbling. Oh my God, it's been crumbling for, talked about being crumbling for the last two or three years. It finally, finally is going to happen, right? Which is great. And what has Out of Home got with its clients, which is brilliant, access to first party data. Let's use it, let's embrace it, and let's go more and more clients leaning in. The measurement side of it, I think, is absolutely robust. If you look at anywhere in the world now, the three most recognisable are yourselves in Australia with Move, Root in the UK, and Geopath. All right? Now, all of them very, very slightly different, which is great, and I think that is all about what works in each individual market. But I, I believe, and I hope you believe in the room today, that what Move have done for you guys has helped your industry um, expand and grow. And I know that there is a route 2.0 or whatever you're calling it coming out soon from talking to Charles um, a couple of weeks ago. And I think that is probably going to move you to being the most robust in the world from what Charles was telling me. I think what we've got to do now is how do we work together? How do these trade bodies help other markets at a cost? Let's be fair here. You've all spent a lot of money in each individual market. But how do you help these markets that don't know what they're doing? Once we can actually get more and more of this rolled out, I think that makes a huge difference to how we go about it. Educate each other. Winning the contest. Now, this one's interesting. Out of home, as we know, doesn't have bots. Okay, it's real people. And it doesn't have made for advertising websites. Okay, that's key. Okay, as I said, we went back earlier. It's the content which drives the online and it's the real world context that drives out of home. We are public, okay? We are, we say, and I believe we are the most trusted, but we have to play on that and we have to prove it. Now, how do we do that? By being open and transparent, okay? You guys as a market have really embraced this, right? And if you look back on verification, online growth was phenomenal when they did independent verification, okay? Because then it allowed a level of trust to come into that medium. And I don't think today in Out of Home, we have that level of trust. As we change, clients are more skeptical and we heard in and I, unfortunately i'm sorry i'm not going to get the names right because i don't know the people but in when i sat through the short panel before um the guy on stage nick i think said my franchises love it they could walk into the mall and they can see it they can see it there right that is so important to a client knowing where their advertising is and when it is or well, when it's going to be there and as we move to a more audience driven time of day, weather triggered, whatever triggers we want to use for programmatic, you take away a little bit of that satisfaction for clients of being able to see their product exactly when they know it's going to be there. So I think independently verifying it is critical. So in summary, and I've tried to keep it to time, I think I'm pretty much under, I've left some time for some questions. Lean in, Educate each other and be educated. Don't be scared of change. Embrace it. Advocate new opportunities. Get clients to buy into new creative. We have one big added bonus in Out of Home that our structures and our locations are as important as our creative that goes on them. But let's showcase the creative. Work together. You compete on a day-to-day -day basis. I get it. Take all your gloves off when you come into a room and let's work out how we can get this one or two percent from online because we're going to otherwise we are going to sit as a four or five percent medium globally for the next 10 years. Support your trade bodies. You guys are great at it. Right. Share them. 
right? At a cost. I mean, other these other markets, they're not going to put the money into a trade body if they're only turning over 100 million a year. But that doesn't mean that some of the methodology is not right for them to use. Right? Embrace third parties. There's a lot of talk at the moment. I was with a client um, at a, another event last week, and one of the big comments on stage there was, what's happening to non-paid media? How much of my money is being wasted? There is a lot of money being taken out of the ecosystem when you look at programmatic. Um, that, I think, is beginning to get a little bit smaller. Okay, So costs are coming down. We've got to push those costs to the lowest common denominator to get more clients onboarded to enable them to know that at the highest possible percentage of their dollar is going to the actual media owner and therefore going on the investment they're making in the media. And automation will create efficiency. I know I didn't touch on it that much in automation because I don't necessarily think it's my place and it's not my greatest skill set. But again, automation is scary from both the buy side and the sell side. I don't believe you'll lose control. I remember when I first got involved in programmatic eight, seven, eight years ago now when it first started being talked about and media owners were like, it's going to be a race to the bottom. It's going to be the lowest possible CPM. It hasn't worked out like that. So we've got to embrace change and move forward with it. I'm going to stop there. And I don't know if questions will work, but I'm here if anybody has any. Um, I can stop sharing my screen. Thanks, thanks so much, Nick. We'll give a question a go. Why don't we try Let's it? try. So we can do it. Anyone want to ask Nick? As long as we don't start with Charles, I'm okay. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Gary, I hope you don't mind me asking another question. That's uh, all right. Can you hear that, Nick, or I can repeat the question? Yeah, I've just about got it, but yeah. maybe you need to repeat it. We'll see. Hello, Nick. Uh, Tim Burrows from Unmade. Um, I wonder if you could speak to one of your last points, the verification side. How are you seeing the verification landscape unfolding, maybe from where you're sitting? I think at the moment it's... It's early stages because I think I, having sat where I sat in a global position and whatever before, I think the market that a lot of this evolution seemed to come out of was Australia. And it's one of the markets that seems to embrace these areas. If I look at the UK at the moment, there is a fear over independent verification. You, know, the, you speak to clients about it and they don't want the media owners marking their own homework, and I get that. And they also don't want the buy side involved with that because you shouldn't have anyone in the ecosystem involved. So they're up for the third party. It's it's going to be a long haul, I think. And I think you guys are ahead of it. Now, I think I'm right in saying this last point as well. I think if I look to all the growth levels for 2023 in out of home globally, I think Australia was at the top. Okay, now... That doesn't mean that verification was the reason, but what it does mean is your embracing of everyone across the ecosystem has enabled you to grow quicker than a lot of markets to push back on it. So I think it's a long, it's a long haul. I think it's needed. And I think it's going to come a time soon where clients are going to start demanding it. Thanks so much. My, yeah, we'll do one more. Oh, Charles. <laughs> get ready, Nick. I said no, didn't I? I did try to say no. <laughs> All right, last one, and then we'll get to the last panel for the day. Great. Thanks, um, Nick, for getting up so early and joining us. Uh, much appreciated, mate. Um, no problem. We had Ben last year, Ben Milne last year, suggests that as a sector we should be aiming towards a 10% share of the omni-channel digital market. So I'm just wondering what your perspective is on that, um, I guess, with your uh, Group N sort of global view. How many times has 10% been thrown around the room? I mean, it's uh, we were talking about 10% share five years ago, eight years ago, three years ago. Um, I, I don't think we should put a number on it, personally. Um, because if we are only running at 4% globally, that's that's pretty appalling um, with the power that we've got and the visualisation of what we can do with creatives and locations and everything. Um, I think it will happen naturally as we work together better and embrace it and see really what the 
the death of the cookie actually means and bringing more people attribution measurement getting all those things more aligned i would love to say 10 percent is achievable within 18 months two years a year i do think it's going to take time 10 percent is a great aspiration to have and i know everyone talks about it i don't think we should set these targets when we're only running at ha under half that at the moment because we're just going to disappoint ourselves a little bit Sort of a tragic note to end, or happy? I'm not sure. No, 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 no. I'm trying not to be. Yes. <laughs> well, we are we are running at about six to seven percent in Australia at the moment, and yeah. if we look at the whole yeah, I mean that is the point I tried to make yeah. at the beginning. Yeah. Obviously, I was looking at my side of it being a holistic global approach, and yeah. I tried to sort of pick that out at the beginning that the, you'll, you'll be sitting there going, "Oh my God, I'm bigger than that." But that also then leads me back to why I think you as a market are a leader in this space okay because of the way you have come together as a medium and really embraced everybody and i think you should be held up as a shining light to the rest of the world thanks Nick. okay that, that's, that's the a better way to finish <laughs> that's a better nick, way to finish it. nick thank you so much on behalf of myself elizabeth charles everyone here thank you so much for your time and your thoughts <laughs> <laughs>